Hello and welcome to the lectures which are part of week 6. Today's session will be looking at chapters 10 to 12 and we'll be looking closely at the romantic plot that's developing uh, among the central uh, male and female character who are Darnay and Lucy. Chapter 10 is titled Two Promises and uh, this chapter begins by giving us a specific context for Darnay's presence in Britain in terms of his professional career. Darnay has become a tutor and he is well respected and he is an elegant translator as well. So this is what the narrator says about him. As a tutor whose attainments made the student's way unusually pleasant and profitable and as an elegant translator who brought something to his work besides mere dictionary knowledge, young Mr. Dani soon became known and encouraged. So this is a very complex portrait of Mr. Darne in terms of his professional context. I am calling it complex for the following reasons which are firstly Mr. Darne is establishing himself as part of a hard working middle class uh, person and uh, he is not doing any mechanical exercise which is uh, uh, indicated through his elegant translation which is not just doing the job of literally translating from one language to another but he also brings something that is original and creative and that is signified uh, in this phrase uh, that he brought something to his work besides mere dictionary knowledge. Dictionary knowledge is um, termed as mere uh, defined or uh, given this particular adjective mere which is simple and commonplace whereas the work that Darnay does uh, becomes creative and original. So there is a kind of a hint that he is doing creative work and uh, that also has associations with the writing profession something that Dickens has uh, discussed in his uh, own fiction especially in the context of David Copperfield. So we need to re remember that particular link and um, in other uh, circumstances Darnay is uh, becoming popular as a tutor because he's very pleasant as well as unusually good at his job and therefore he is enjoying a certain amount of recognition and respect in the home uh, that he has chosen which is is Great Britain and this is uh, further what the narrator has to say about him. He had expected labor and he found it and did it and made the best of it. In this his prosperity uh, consisted. So he is um, following the hard work ethic which is at the foundation of the middle class ethos and he is prospering at it and we need to contrast Mr. Darnay with Mr. Striver who is also embodying the excess uh, of the middle class ethic. He is striving so hard uh, and in such an obvious and hard manner that he is pushing other people aside. So that is Mr. Striver and this is Mr. Darnay who is the perfect embodiment, the ideal middle ground between Striver and the other working classes who are slogging away. Now we come to the romantic plot uh, which is uh, germinating uh, in book two. We saw certain indications of the art uh, in book one uh, but it is beginning uh, in a truly obvious manner in this particular book which is book two and the narrator says that this is a common theme. Uh, what is a common theme? Romance is a common theme. The love of women always dictates the world of men. That seems the uh, that seems to be the point that the narrator wants to communicate in this particular excerpt, and he uh, does it in a very poetic way uh, by connecting the world of Eden with the world uh, of today which is 18th century uh, England, late uh, 18th century England. So which is fallen, which has uh, fallen when compared to the world of uh, Eden before uh, Adam and Eve committed the sin. 
All right, now from the days when it was always summer in Aden to these days when it's mostly winter in, fall in fallen latitudes, the world of a man has invariably gone one way, Charles Darnay's way, the way of the love of a woman. So Charles Darnay's way is, all, is the ways of all the men uh, which seems to be uh, their inclination to fall in love with a woman. So that is the romantic uh, premise that this excerpt is talking about. Now, let's look at the uh, small courtship plots which are uh, beginning to unravel and which has Lucy Minette as the key uh, central character. So, we have Charles Dunney who has expressed interest in Lucy Minette and that was indicated during the trial scene in which uh, Darnay was indicted, uh, accused of being a spy and from which he escaped. So that's Charles Darnay's context and we have Mr. Striver who is also going to show some romantic interest. I'll come to that uh, shortly but it's very interesting to see that this man is also uh, uh, trying to win uh, or trying to offer um, for Lucy Manette. Uh, and then we have Sydney Carton who is also affected by Lucy Minette and we saw that very clearly uh, in the trial scene and uh, we also saw that he uh, is also um, affected by Lucy Minette and that was very clear during that uh, uh, symbolic vision uh, that we talked about in our previous lectures, the uh, vision of a beautiful fantastical city that he sees uh, which is which becomes a mirage which crumbles and Sidney Carton goes to bed in tears. So, um, behind that symbolic fantastical scene is uh, Sydney's awareness that he's not going to succeed with Lucy Minette. So, he has always uh, already uh, become conscious of his failure there, but there it is. So, these are all the courtship plots that are uh, forming and which uh, give a lot of interest to the uh, scenes which come uh, in book 2. Striver is the advocate we should remember that who was helpful in getting um, Car Charles Darnay out of a difficult quandary with the help of Sidney Carton. Now we have uh, Darnay visiting Soho Squire. He uh, meets the father of Lucy Minette and uh, he tells him that he understands that Lucy has a special bond with him. Uh, and um, he describes that bond in this manner. He says that I know that in loving you, she sees and loves her mother at her own age, sees and loves you at my age, loves her mother broken hearted, loves you through your dreadful trial and in your blessed restoration. I have known this night and day since I've known you in your home. So, uh, Charles Darnay gives a very uh, beautiful as well as a significant summation of the bond uh, that is uh, present between Lucy and Dr. Bennett. He says that she thinks of herself um, like her mother uh, who lost her husband at a very early age and he also says that um, she thinks of you uh, in, her, in your youth and how uh, terribly you suffer during that dreadful trial and um, so all these are special associations that she has uh, in terms of the bond that she has with you now. So I know this and that is um, Darnay's acknowledgement of the bond, the special unique secret bond and he calls this uh, light that is around Lucy and Dr. Minette as hallowed. Hallowed means sanctified, blessed by God, something that is sacred, the bond becomes sacred. So, uh, by acknowledging the relationship between uh, Dr. Minette and Lucy Minette as something that is uh, uh, sacred and, and something that is special, Darnay also reveals his gentlemanly, his noble qualities and uh, through such a revelation the readers are made to understand that he is perhaps uh, um, a, a better candidate to uh, marry Lucy Minette because he will not come in the way of the bond between the father and daughter. 
So this is Darney's proposal, um, and it's, very, it's a very interesting proposal because he doesn't talk to Lucy Minette yet. He hasn't uh, received her uh, acceptance of his love. Instead of going straight to her, he goes first to the father. It's a very old-fashioned way of uh, dealing with such a romantic uh, matter. And he uh, tells the father that, I look only to sharing your fortunes, sharing your life and home, and being faithful to you to the death not to divide with Lucy her privilege as your child, companion, and friend, but to come in aid of it and bind her closer to you, if such a thing can be. So um, let's look at the key words that are scattered in this excerpt. The key words uh, to me is sharing, which is repeated twice, and uh, the other is faithful. and. Um, he says that I'll be loyal to you and I'll share the bond that Lucy shares with you and I will not come in between um, between you and Lucy and she will continue to be your child, your friend, uh, your companion but I will also come to help her in strengthening the bond that is there between you two. So uh, what is clear here is that even though there is a romantic association uh, German between uh, Lucy and Darnay, what is important for this novel is the um, paternal connection between Lucy and Dr. Manette. So that seems to be central and the romantic plot seems to be somehow subsidiary to this familial bond between Lucy and her father. So we need to keep that in mind and, and try to figure out why this bond is uh, considered to be supreme uh, in, in contrast to the other bonds that are there in the uh, novel. And this is uh, Dr. Manette's response to Charles Darnay's proposal. Uh, and he is also very generous because he realizes uh, Darnay's sincerity in uh, his description of uh, his affections for his daughter as well as for um, the daughter's father. Um, and, and he responds uh, in, a, in a similar fashion of being extremely generous and noble. And therefore he says that any fancies, any reasons, any apprehensions, anything whatsoever, new or old, against the man she really really loved the direct responsibility thereof not lying on his head, they should all be obliterated for her sake. She's everything to me, more to me than suffering, more to me than wrong. And uh, it's a very interesting response, a very curious response as well. Curious because there are certain hints about the mystery that's there uh, which is connected to Dr. Manette's past. So uh, it's curious because it's mysterious, because of certain unknown uh, details which connect uh, with Dr. Manette's past. So what is uh, Dr. Manette saying here? He says that, I will not hold anything against you if you haven't done anything directly wrong, if you have not committed any crime directly and if Lucy Minette uh, loves you, um, I will not stand between you and my daughter. So that is the message that Dr. Minette offers uh, Darnay and uh, he says that any fancies, any speculations, any reasons, any fears, anything old or new, this is a very interesting phrase, new uh, crimes or past crimes associated with the man she loves, if that man is not directly responsible for those crimes, will be forgiven, will be forgiven by me so that uh, my daughter could marry him. So uh, he declares that she is everything to me. Lucy is my everything. She is more important to me than all the suffering that I have undergone in the past, especially the past which put me uh, 18 years of my life in the Bastille. And she is also more important to me uh, than all the wrongs committed against me. So for Dr. Manette, Lucy's happiness is supreme. Everything else comes next. 
So Darne offers certain information about his uh, past uh, as a kind of uh, uh, his contribution uh, which acknowledges the generosity of uh, Dr. Minet and he tries to tell him something important, something which has not been revealed so far to Dr. Minet about his past and he says that my present name though but slightly changed from my mother's is not as you will remember my own. I wish to tell you what that is and why I am in England. So uh, Darne uh, acknowledges uh, something that uh, Dr. Manette also knows which is that Dr. Uh, which is that Darne's name is not his original name. It, this name is a slight variation of his mother's uh, name and he wants to tell the doctor what is his real identity and his reason for being in England. So there is a motive for uh, Darnay's uh, choosing England as his home and that is also very interesting because we do not know what exactly that is uh, till now and we think that we are about to receive some kind of striking revelation about Darnay. So um, this is also one of the themes that we have talked about in this novel which is um, you know hidden mysteries, hidden secrets and uh, the drive to know the real identity. So uh, he is about to offer some crucial information and uh, what happens after this uh, desire that uh, Darne expresses, he is stopped. He is stopped by Dr. Manette who says that do not tell me anything right now. You talk to my doctor uh, and if she agrees, if she accepts your proposal and if you get married on the day, do tell me your uh, um, origins. So uh, Dr. Manette stops him right now. Darne, Darne is not able to proceed further than he did with this information. So uh, we are prevented from knowing the uh, real past, the concrete past, the hidden past, the real identity of Darne and his uh, connections. And uh, our question is why does um, Dr. Manette stop him and we are also uh, suspicious of the fact that perhaps uh, Dr. Manette has some kind of indication about Darne's uh, origins and he does not want to know about it until he knows for certain that his daughter will accept him and um, connected to this point is this uh, uh, idea that uh, Dr. Manette is not guiding his daughter's uh, romantic uh, uh, connections, he is allowing his daughter to make up her own mind. So that point also becomes clear here and uh, Darnay's mystery continues. This is chapter 11 uh, which is titled A Companion Picture. Uh, this title indicates that it is a companion picture to the two promises chapter which came earlier which was chapter 10 and let us see what uh, kind of parallel there are between this chapter and the previous chapter. Now Mr. Striver is um, talking to Sidney Carton and uh, he tells Carton that he is planning on marrying Lucy Manette and this is what he says, I do not care about fortune, she is a charming creature and I have made up my mind to please myself, on the whole I think I can afford to please myself. She will have in me a man already pretty well off and a rapidly rising man and a man of some distinction, it is a piece of good fortune for her but she is worthy of good fortune, are you astonished? So this question is asked to Sidney Carton. It is a very um, interesting and comical paragraph and I will tell you why it is interesting because it once again lays bare uh, the middle class characteristic which are these. Um, Mr. Striver is a rising man, he is rising in the world, he is upwardly mobile and he is a man of some distinction because he has made a name for himself in the legal circles. So. Uh, Upward mobility is a middle class um, characteristic and we have uh, 
professional distinction becoming a marker of the middle class ethos too. And he's also wealthy. He's independently wealthy. And he says that Lucy doesn't have any fortune. Lucy is not very rich, but I don't care. I have a lot of money. I'm pretty well off. And in fact, she is fortunate to uh, get uh, married to a man like me. And um, he asks, um, Sydney, are you astonished? And he says, why should I be astonished? And this is the illustration of Mr. Striver by Harry Furness for the 1910 edition. Look at the way his uh, upper body is thrust forward. He is striving, literally, physically striving, and he is pushing away people who are in his path. And look at his smug face, who is very, very uh, sure of himself, overconfident. And this attitude also reflects his pomposity. He is almost ridiculous, but he doesn't uh, realize that. It's a very funny portrait that we have of uh, Mr. Striver by Furness. And this is Mr. Striver's advice to uh, Sidney Carton whom he thinks is absolutely reckless of his personal uh, comfort. And he says that uh, the best thing for him uh, to do would be to marry. Provide somebody to take care of you. Never mind you're having no enjoyment of women's society, nor understanding of it, nor tact for it. Find out somebody, find out some respectable woman with a little property, somebody in the landlady way or lodging letting way, marry her against a rainy day, that's the kind of thing for you. Now think of it, Sydney. So this is uh, his advice. And this advice is also comical because it's also very ironical. Ironical because it is also reflecting uh, ridiculously on his own context in terms of Lucy Minette. Because we do know that it's not Sydney who doesn't have any understanding of women's society or enjoyment of women's company or any kind of tact for it. In fact, we do know that it is Striver who is completely tactless. It's he who doesn't know how to move about in women's company. And therefore, uh, it's, it's very funny uh, and comical to realize uh, Striver offering advice to Sidney Carton, who is very, uh, uh, very, very aware of the uh, psyche of women and their uh, desires and their uh, inclinations uh, um, of life. And he says that, Striver says that find out somebody, get married to uh, some woman who has a property, perhaps some landlady or uh, who uh, lets lodgings for outsiders. And he says it's marry her against a rainy day. This phrase is very interesting because he says that uh, getting married is a security bank blanket for Sydney Carton at least because he thinks that such a woman would uh, be uh, very interested in taking care of you. It's the job of women to take care of men. And um, he says that that's the thing for you. Now think of it. Think of my advice carefully, Sydney. So the point of this excerpt is to reveal uh, the comical uh, side to Mr. Striver and to turn him into a buffoon like character. who doesn't have any diplomacy or any tact for uh, dealing with uh, women. Chapter 12 uh, is titled The Fellow of Delicacy and it's also an ironic title because it is um, referring to 
because it is referring to Mr. Striver and we know that Mr. Striver is not at all uh, diplomatic, not at all a fellow of delicacy. In fact, he is the fellow of indelicacy. That would be the right phrase to describe Mr. Striver. So, what does Mr. Striver do? As soon as he has told uh, Sidney Carton that he is going to offer for the hand of Lucy Minette, he just leaves his uh, chambers, he goes straight to Soho Square and on the way he stops at Telson's bank. And who is there in the bank? It is Mr. Lorry and he tells Mr. Lorry about his opinions uh, regarding marriage and he just uh, informs him that he uh, is going to offer for Lucy's hand. And um, Mr. Lorry is shocked uh, when he hears of this particular piece of news and instead of uh, knowing, um, you know, what exactly did tell him he just says um, uh, you know there's really so much of you you are you are a handful uh, you are uh, there's so much uh, of of the striver and uh, he says that uh, Mr. Laurie says that I wouldn't go on such an object without having some cause to believe that I should succeed. So he is uh, warning uh, Mr. Striver here and he says if I were you I wouldn't go to Soho Square without knowing that Miss Lucy Minette will accept my proposal. So, he is indirectly trailing Striver, uh, just get a sense that she would accept you and then go there to formally tell her, ask her to marry him. And this is a, again a very comic moment, uh, the comic element is especially uh, there in this particular statement of Mr. Laurie when he says that uh, you know there is so much of you that you, you are uh, uh, occupying a lot of space in the sense that uh, you, your ego, your personality over dominates everybody. And it would be difficult for the other person to accept you, to deal with you. And this is that interesting illustration of Mr. Striver uh, meeting Mr. Laurie. This is done by uh, Hablet uh, Knight Brown, who is also known as Fizz. This is the illustrator and it is a very interesting picture because we see that Mr. Laurie is surrounded by his books, all his records. He is a man of business um, and that is apparent here and he is uh, leaning towards the table and he has all his account books and all these suggest that he is a man of uh, diligence and extremely careful in uh, keeping records and we have this pompous figure uh, Mr. Striver who is intruding on the space of uh, Mr. Laurie. And we have a companion picture to this illustration and uh, I will show that to you in the following uh, uh, sessions um, and uh, that uh, illustration is in uh, connection with Madame Defarge. Uh, in fact, I think we have seen that picture and we will also see that again in the scene where uh, we have a spy meeting Madame Defarge. So, uh, there is an echo of this particular arrangement of characters and uh, this particular kind of setup, especially um, the record keeping objects uh, associated with the table uh, is evoked in that picture too of Madame Defarge when she is um, kind of having a conversation with a spy. So, uh, the theme will be repeated again. And this is uh, again uh, Mr. Laurie depicted by Harry Furness in 1910. Uh, the posture is also very interesting, the fact that he is leaning over his table poring over the record books. tells us once again the amount of importance and significance given to business. And similar postures are also to be found uh, in connection with Madame Defarge as I pointed out a moment ago and she is also found at a table 
even though she is knitting, um, we also know that she is also the one who keeps track of the accounts of the wine shop business. So there is a similarity, a financial parallel between the record keeper, Mr. Laurie, the man of business, and this woman of business, Madame Defarge. Now, we have uh, Lucy Manette being talked about by Mr. Laurie and Mr. Striver. And this is Mr. Laurie who says that, I speak of causes and reasons that will tell as such with the young lady. The young lady goes before all. He says that um, the choice of the young lady is absolutely key, absolutely important. And if she has, um, you know, reason not to choose you, then she is at liberty to do that. And um, to which uh, Mr. Striver responds by saying, it's your deliberate opinion that the young lady at present in question is a mincing fool. So, uh, so Mr. Striver is being harsh here about uh, Miss Manette. And why is he harsh? He's harsh because he realizes that she may not accept him or uh, another interpretation could be that if she uh, doesn't accept him then she is a fool. So uh, only a fool can reject the proposal of marriage uh, from Mr. Striver. So um, again this has a comic as well as a disturbing element. Um, the, the scene and this conversation between Mr. Laurie and Mr. Striver is interesting firstly because Mr. Laurie uh, offers Lucy Minette the liberty to make up her mind just as her father did. He thinks that it is legitimate for Lucy to make her choice. Um, that is Mr. Laurie's opinion and we can see the reverse being the true for Mr. Striver who thinks that uh, anybody who rejects him, any female who re rejects him should be a fool, would be a fool. So we can see the autocratic behavior in Mr. Striver. And once Mr. Striver has uh, said something uh, unacceptable about Lucy Manette, which is that she is a mincing fool to refuse him. Mr. Laurie is incensed. He's angered by the attitude of Mr. Striver. He says that I will hear no disrespectful word of that young lady from any lips. And if that I knew any man whose taste was so coarse and whose temper was so overbearing that he could not restrain himself from being speaking disrespectfully of that young lady at this desk, not even Telson should prevent my giving him a piece of of my mind. Indirectly, Mr. Laurie is warning Mr. Striver to mind his language. If you speak disrespectfully of Miss Lucy Manette, then I will show you a piece of my mind. I will uh, respond uh, adequately, appropriately, and that will not be um, uh, gentlemanly. All right. So the uh, Mr. Laurie is, um, you know, incensed, and it's one of the rare moments in the novel where we see uh, the anger displayed by Mr. Laurie. And in fact, he indirectly also tells Mr. Striver that he is one coarse, two overbearing, and three very disrespectful. So all these um, attitudes of Mr. Striver are spelt out by Mr. Laurie indirectly and he is also uh, pointing, out that, pointing out that he is a fierce protector of Lucy Minette and not even Telson's bank would prevent him from showing his anger towards a man who would disrespect that young lady who is Lucy Minette. So, uh, Mr. Striver is warned by Mr. Laurie and this is a very rare moment in the novel. 
instead what does uh, Mr. Lorry suggest even though he has indirectly communicated to Mr. Lorry that he would uh, um, you know uh, show anybody who disrespects uh, Miss Lucy Minette a piece of his mind he tells Mr. Lorry that he would go to Soho Square first on a fact finding mission find out uh, from Miss Lucy Minette if his proposal that is Mr. Shriver's proposal would be accepted by that young lady and he says that he would do that uh, in the evening and then come back to the chambers of Mr. Striver. So, he says that that, is, that would be the plan and that would prevent Mr. Striver from uh, committing any kind of unacceptable act or activity. Now, uh, the barrister was keen enough to divine that the banker would not have gone so far in his expression of opinion on any less solid ground than moral certainty. Unprepared as he was for the large bill he had to swallow, he got it down and now, said Mr. Striver, shaking his forensic forefinger at the temple in general, when it was down, my way out of this is to put you all in the wrong. So, this is the opinion of the narrator about Mr. Striver's thought process as he has um, you know left the Telson's bank and he is walking back and as he is walking back to his place Mr. Striver processes the information that Mr. Laurie offered him and he realizes that Mr. Laurie would not have come up with this plan of um, him going first to Soho Square unless he knew for sure that uh, Lucy Bennett would not accept him. So, it is a bit of pill it's a bitter pill for a large pill that he had to swallow it's a pill of disappointment and Mr. Striver finds it difficult to swallow that pill but then he gets it down he gets that pill uh, down and he says that um, you know I will not be disappointed I will not be humiliated by the lot of you which includes Lucy Minette and Mr. Laurie and others and he says that uh, I will get my way out of this particular mess by putting you all in the wrong I will put uh, everybody else uh, to be in the wrong uh, position and and uh, possessing the wrong attitude and uh, he repeats you shall not put me in the wrong young lady he tells himself I will do that for you I'll uh, put you in the wrong so he is not able to accept any kind of disappointment and defeat even if it is in the matters of the heart even if it is something to do with romance and um, um, domestic affairs so he always wants to be in the right and that again um, suggests his autocritic uh, high-handed manner and finally we have Mr. Lorry coming back to the chambers of Mr. Striver uh, in the evening and even before Mr. Lorry could uh, you know uh, tell him what had happened uh, in his meeting with the family at Soho Square, Mr. Striver um, you know starts talking and he does not let Mr. Laurie get a word in edgewise and he says that Mr. Striver says that both for selfish and unselfish reasons this proposal of marrying uh, Miss Lucy Minette would have been a bad thing for me in a worldly point of view. In other words this is not financially favorable for me because the implication is that uh, Lucy Minette is not very um, uh, fortunate she does not have a lot of money fortunate in the literal sense she is not wealthy. So, um, for both these reasons I am not going to marry her it will not be good good for me and he says there is no harm at all done I have not proposed to the young lady and between ourselves I am by no means certain on reflection that I ever should have committed myself to that extent Mr. Lorry, you cannot control the mincing vanities and giddinesses of empty headed girls. You must not expect to do it or you will always be disappointed. So, there are two things going on in that paragraph. One is that he claims 
that after reflection, after having thought about the matter, he would not even have uh, offered a, a marriage to Lucy Minette. I would not have uh, gone to that extent of going home and asking her to marry me. So, um, I would not have proposed. So, all this is unnecessary bother on your part that is one thing. So, that uh, actually reflects his hypocrisy on the part of uh, Mr. Striver and then he says uh, another uh, um, you know idea which is that um, Mr. Laurie you cannot control you cannot manage the mincing vanities the vanities and superficial behavior of your empty headed girls. So, once again he is indirectly um, finding fault with uh, Miss Lucy Minette he is indirectly insulting her by calling her empty headed you know full of vanities and giddinesses uh, all these superficial qualities are attributed to Lucy and he says that Mr. Laurie you cannot do anything about it you cannot expect to control all these behavior even if you try to do that you will be disappointed. So, uh, look at the way he turns the situation around as if uh, you know it is Mr. Laurie who had expected did Miss Lucy Minette to marry Mr. Striver and then she has refused because she is silly and therefore he uh, is disappointed. So, Mr. Laurie is somehow humiliated, he, Mr. Laurie is put in such a position where he is uh, shown to have been wrong in his assumptions and uh, Mr. Striver comes out as the man who is trying to comfort him and trying to um, you know. Uh, make sense of this situation. So, Mr. Striver is very complex in this regard of turning situations around and uh, uh, somehow uh, demeaning the stature, reducing the stature of the uh, good people who are around him. So, even though Mr. Striver has a comic side, he also has this kind of disturbing set of attributes which need to be acknowledged and recognized too. Thank you for watching, I will continue in the next session.